Today, I've got a true taste of Britain. I'll be dipping into the sea and taking to the countryside. And if you love meringues, and let's face it, who doesn't, I'm going to be making you very happy indeed. Hello and welcome to Pies and Puts. Sweet or savoury, I've got something for everyone on the show today. Coming up, I'm all at sea off the Scottish coast, trying to do justice to the bounteous ocean that surrounds our British Isles. I love that. With the most luxurious fish pie I can muster, topped off with a decadent and delicious saffron and crab mash. I meet a couple who have made it their life's work to bottle the flavours of summer which I use to add another dimension to my individual fruit pies. That's beautiful. And if you think meringues are kind of retro, think again. That's gin and tonic. Yeah. I meet two ladies bringing the humble meringue back with a bang. And they'll be helping me with the crowning glory for my dessert, the queen of puddings. And all my guests get stuck into delicious dishes on today's menu. Mm. Delicious That's and creamy. Stuff. It's great. Mm. And if you want to try my recipes for yourself, you'll find the details on the BBC website. My first recipe is a fish pie like no other. This isn't your average Friday night white fish, white sauce and mash affair. Oh no, I'm taking the humble fish pie and drop kicking it into heaven. I'm here today on the east coast of Scotland in the beautiful fishing village of Pittenween, where they keep that great tradition of fishing still alive. Now I'm going out with the fishermen this morning and I hope I catch a little bit more than white fish. Mike Bruce has been fishing off this coast for nearly 20 years. What he doesn't know about local fishing isn't worth knowing. Mike has invited me out on his boat to catch something extra special for my lavish fish pie, langoustines. Has it always been langoustine that's been your speciality? Is that what you concentrate on? Yeah, uh, the boat, when we first got the boat, it was, the boat's capable of catching fish and that as well, but just the, the changes in legislation and whatever, it's, it's um, limited what we're allowed to catch. Yeah. So it really is just nethrops that we're allowed to, langoustine that we're allowed to catch. How do you like your langoustine? I love strong cocktails, so we make a, a, a cocktail sauce um, to go over them, but the best thing is just to boil the kettle and the kettle straight over them and, and eat them straight away, especially if they're, if they're fresh out of the sea. Known as prawns by the locals, the langoustine is actually a small orange lobster caught in parts of the Atlantic Ocean. It's renowned for its succulent meat and delicate flavour, and it's most commonly found deep-fried in breadcrumbs as the classic pub dish, scampi. How deep is this at the moment, then? Um, we're in about 25 fathom, which What's is that in real money? 50 metres. So these are just the weights, are they, to hold it down? Yeah, it's just a set of what we call rubber legs that are around the bottom of the net. Because there's small discs on it, it keeps the, the net just up off the bottom, that little bit. Allows you to work firmer ground. So how long how, do you then leave this and then come back for it? Yeah, we'll, we'll probably set it, we'll set it for half an hour for today, but normally we tow for um, up to four hours. Half an hour later, it's time to check the net, and it looks like we've come up trumps with the langoustines I need for my recipe. One thing I find absolutely crazy, though, is, you know, in the UK, we seem to be importing Norwegian prawns. And then the, prawn, the, the langoustines that are here, the prawns that are here, are actually going back the other way. Yeah, well, we've got fantastic product right on your doorstep. Yeah, and it's, it's I a can shame see that it. it's. And it's, I mean, the, the prawns are landed fresh daily here every day, and it has been that way for, for quite some time. And it's a shame that it goes out of the country. Absolutely, yeah. So, what do you reckon about using langoustine in the pie? Good choice? Definitely, yeah. And as a prawn fisherman, you, you kind of get a better product. Healthier, tasty, non fattening. Perfect. Thanks very much, Mike. I'll see you soon, buddy. Yep, no problem. I love that. I've already got one luxury ingredient for my fish pie, but I need more. 
Most of the local catches are sold in the fish market. So, I drop by to discover what other tasty maritime treats might go into my Rolls Royce of fish pies. What I'm looking for is flavours to go inside my pie, and I'm looking for a bit of luxury. What do you recommend? Here's some uh, crabs. Oh, you got crabs. Crab could be useful, maybe a little bit of mash. Talking about your pie, I was just thinking, what about monkfish? That's, that goes yeah. well with the uh, prawns. Perfect. Ah, uh, that's the fella. There you go. Now, that's very good with prawns. In yeah. fact, at one time, the monkfish, the, the tail of the monk, was actually used to make scampi when monk was cheap. Yeah. Now, it's gone full circle. Monk is an expensive fish. Prawns are the cheaper ones, so everybody uses prawns more than they would use monkfish. Exactly. But uh, that is a good mix, prawns and monkfish. I mean, it's an ugly fish. It's a very ugly fish, but, but it's a very it nice good. tasting fish. <laughs> it's a perfect. I'll probably use a little bit of the crab as well somewhere. I'm not yes, sure yet. Yes. But it's beginning to form a plan. I think I've got all my component parts for my fish pie, but earlier, Mike gave me a tip-off. He likes his langoustines to get the five-star treatment and sends them off to be smoked at the East Pier Smokehouse. I've only travelled a couple of miles down the coast, but this, apparently, is where the magic happens. James Robb has been smoking locally caught langoustines for five years, and there's something of a regional delicacy. What do you do to this langoustine which which essentially is a beautiful food anyway. How do you make it even more special? Well, it's an interesting question, Paul, because obviously these beautiful prawns, I mean, they're you know, one of the world's finest delicacies, but I wanted to, to produce something that was obviously local and uh, really add to the taste that was already there. And uh, I think once these are boiled and gently smoked, it adds a lovely sort of toasted quality to the prawn. It, it has a very subtle, sweet flavour nutty, almost like a fine champagne. I think it would go very well in your pie. OK, I'm down to see what they taste like. This is the smokehouse that was um, always here. It's an old smokehouse. It's been on the pier for about 40 years now. It's just a simple structure. There's no heat in here. It's just for cold smoking. Yeah. And it's ideal for this, because we're just trying to give a smoke flavour. We're not really uh, curing it, and it's, it's got no length of time in there. Yeah. So I'll show you. These are the prawns that we did earlier. And um, if you head upstairs, I can yeah. give you a taste of them. Mm. Hi, Paul. Oh, These are good. the smoked langoustine, fresh from the smoker. Wow. That is stunning. I mean, really, really, I mean, I love langoustine anyway, but that, that smokiness that adds to it, it adds, it really yeah, does subtle, add. It's isn't it? It's simple, and I know it almost seems sacrilegious for something that's so delicate as, as a langoustine of sweetmeat, but it, it really works, and I just think it would be great in your pie. Have another. <laughs> Take in. Absolutely. Delicious, and they will definitely be going in my pie. I've got here the fish that I brought back from Pit and Ween, and this is one of the little fellas here. Beautiful langoustine. And Mike, thank you very much for letting us again on your on your boat. That was a fantastic day out. The weather was fantastic as well. Yeah, quite lucky, yeah. It's amazing what you get in Barbados, isn't it? That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is a luxury fish pie. This is going to take that little humble fish pie that you normally have at home on a, on a Friday or pretty much any day of the week and make it luxury. With the use of this, these little fellas, I'm going to use monkfish too. I've got some salmon. Now, I've got a job for you, Mike. You, know, you can guess what it's going to be. There's your beautiful langoustine. Could you shell the rest of them for me, please? And I'll use sure. as many as I can in, in my pie. What I'm going to do is actually start in this pan at the moment I've got some liquor, so basically it's perno, it's water, it's fennel, and it's onion. That's bubbling away nicely. The monkfish 
I think is such a meaty, hearty fish. Now, I've cut this into, into pieces, and likewise with the salmon as well. Now, I'm going to pop this straight into the liquor and just cook it for three, four minutes. And it, the liquor, the perno that permeates into the fish, it gives it a gorgeous flavour, especially fennel. Fennel and fish is a marriage made in heaven. It's going to poach away for three to four minutes, so it's nice and tender. Poaching is a perfect cooking technique for delicate foods such as fish. It not only prevents it from drying out and preserves the natural taste, but can also infuse it with extra flavour, in this case, the perno and fennel. What did you think of the catch that we got that day? Because, to be honest, it was OK. But you were telling me earlier that you went out in the afternoon and caught, I mean, a, a boat full. Yeah, well, ten times as much as what we caught when, when you were regarded you as a Jonah, bad luck Jonah, so... It, well, it's not me, then. It's, that'll probably be the cameraman or the guy who's holding the sound. It wouldn't be me. Oh, we'll go for that, then. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. So you seriously went out and caught a huge load? Well, we towed for two hours. Um, I think we towed for 40 minutes when you were there, and it was very little, and went out for two hours and, and filled the, the net. Short space of time, so... And so the guy that works with you on the boat, did he blame me as well? Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Why? Just cause, I mean, if you never had a bad catch? Oh, no, you get quite a lot of them, but you've, you always look for somebody to blame for it. And so, <laughs> That's what so it is, isn't were, it? Were it's got to do with me. Were you getting the blame? It took it off of me, so... <laughs> I'd love to go out again. I mean, next time... I mean, I, I found that whole experience on the boat, I mean, thrilling. It was, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the fish. It's been poached literally for about three minutes. It's got that little bit of bounce to it. That's the perfect way of cooking it. Perno. Yep. A little bit of alcohol. And I'm going to drop this in a place. And I've already got some salmon in there. Put the monkfish straight in there. Fish it out. Be nice and gentle. This is how you catch fish, Mike. Right here. It's the easy way. <laughs> is, yeah. You need, you, need a, you need a slotted spoon, and that's it. You just go out and catch them. Put your salmon. Spread it all over the bottom. And again, this is luxury. This is, we're really going for the top end here. I mean, monkfish is becoming quite trendy now as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. It's, it seems to be quite a sustainable... Um, product, um, special on the West Coast. But... Yeah. That's the, the sauce with all the, the pen, and I'm going to use this liquid now by draining it off. You reduce that down, and it ends up like this. Very rich in colour. The smell of the perno, the fennel, the fish has been in there. But to that, I'm going to add a quick roux. <laughs> To make a basic roux, simply cook out equal parts of butter and flour in a pan for two to three minutes. How do you eat your, your fish, then, when you catch it? You certainly don't eat it fresh. The best thing is actually to leave it in the, the, the fridge for a day or two uh, to sit in its own juice. The, the worst thing ever, as far as we're concerned as fishermen, is to eat fish straight out of the sea. So you're saying the best time to eat a fish is a day later? Yeah. What, why is that? It just, if, if you sit in its own juice, it, it tastes so much better. Most of the fish that you actually get in this country is quite a few days old from catch anyway. Yeah. Um, it's frozen and that straight away, so it's at the, the peak of its, its condition when you actually get it, but it's, it's more than just a couple of days old, so... Well, OK, these are a couple of days old, then. Well, you brought them down, so you must have done, so this must have been, what, a day before yesterday? I'll be able to tell when I taste them. You could tell that the, if they're fresh prawns, they've just got a... You, Basically, enough taste to see from them. Yeah. And you can see this now. Basically, it's, it's your roux, which has been cooked out, and you add all this liquid. Once all the liquid has been added and you cook it down, you end up with this. Now, this is going to be the basis for your sauce at the moment. If I just warm that up, slacken it down a little bit... Now, this beautifully shelled langoustine there is going to go on top of the monkfish and the salmon. I mean, you only have to look at that. You could just sit there with a load of chips and mayonnaise and just eat that as it is. To finish the sauce, I add cream and freshly chopped tarragon to the pan and keep stirring over a low heat for five minutes or so until the sauce has thickened. Finally, pour your luxurious sauce over the fish. Normally, you'd, you'd probably have just a very basic roux inside it, if anything. Mm -hmm. Some people just put the fish, maybe a little bit of milk... Yeah. ..and then just put the, the mashed potato on top of that. So what we're looking at here is something a little bit special. So we spread that out all over the bottom of the dish, and you're thinking to yourself, mm. what are we are going to put on top of that? What I've got here is mashed potato. It's been infused, and you can see all the way through, with saffron. It's that gold. It's that beautiful gold, yellow colour in there at the moment. That, on top of that, is going to be delicious. But to make it even more special, 
if it's at all possible. When I was at the fishing village at Petawin, we went round and we saw beautiful crab. This is the crab. So I thought, hang on, a little bit of crab in there as well. Just lace through that mashed potato. I think, again, we'll take it to another level. So just basically mix up all the mash together with the crab, and then we're going to throw it on top of the, the fish. So you basically get a fork and just spread it all over the top of the fish pie. You're dying for this, aren't you, mate? Yeah, have I done, have I done you proud most, so most far? Swatting. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Even though you blame me for not catching anything. Bar of coal. You could love for that. <laughs> I can't believe it. I always thought the fishermen in, in, in Scotland have a tough life. Um, it was, what, 26 degrees, just bouncing along on the waves, coming back with a boatload of fish. How difficult can it be? That, that was a good day. <laughs> <laughs> and this is going to taste fantastic. I bake my luxury fish pie at 200 degrees for 25 to 30 minutes until the top is golden brown. Look at this. That is what you call a luxurious fish pie. Now, again, you've got the langoustines, you've got the salmon, you've got the monkfish, you've got the saffron, you've got that beautiful sauce made with the perno, and then to top it all, gorgeous mash with cream inside that and crab as well. That's going to be one great fish pie. This really is an extra special fish pie, and I can't wait to share it with my guests. Still to come, I meet two girls putting meringues back on the map. So you, do you think that this is the new thing? It is the new thing. Do you think we so? We know it's the new thing. But first, it's time for some seriously tasty individual fruit pies. But to take them to the whole new level, I want to add something rather special. People have been picking and preserving fruit for generations. My search for some fruity flavour led to a couple who capture the flavours growing all around them and bottle them. This is Cairn and Moore Winery in Perthshire, where Ron and Judith Gillies have been brewing up country wines out of fruit, flowers and even leaves for over a quarter of a century. I'm wondering whether their unique flavours will be the perfect complement to my fruit pies. Judith's love affair with country wine started many years ago. My mum made everything. She cooked, she baked, she made beer, she, and she made wine. And then I met Ron, who had got this book, and he'd started making wine because he was interested in drinking, I think. And so when the two of us got together, it was uh, obviously meant. <laughs> Now, Judith's following in her mum's footsteps, and alongside husband Ron, they're turning their passion into profit. Their winemaking venture has been a phenomenal success, and their business now employs over 20 people to crush, ferment, and barrel their wines with some outstanding results. It's a lot of fun uh, making fruit wines, um, but, uh, you know, it's quality stuff. We've won some, some major awards over the years. Uh, just say, uh, kick back some of this raspberry. I mean, it's, we go back to 2004, but it was the champion British wine of 2004. Seems a long time ago, but they actually stopped doing the competition after we kept winning it. So standards are pretty high, and it's not surprising. Perthshire enjoys an abundance of farm-grown berries, so Ron and Judith had the best quality fruit right on their doorstep. This is a fantastic raspberry growing area, and the raspberries coming in really flavoursome. And uh, it makes a lovely, really intense, fruity, uh, rosy wine. It's really nice. Ron and Judith are always on the lookout for new ingredients for their country wines. Today, they're doing some old-fashioned foraging to find a new flavour wine to add to their repertoire. Even when you're out for a walk, you know, he's always picking things and chewing them. I say, try that, try that. You know, you're picking something, and while you're picking that, you notice something else. You think, oh, I'm going to have a go at that next year. This is one I've had my eye on for a long time, is the meadow sweet. Quite powerful scent. It might be a thing that you would blend with something else. I know it's going to be good. Meadow sweet wine sounds promising, and Judy's got an idea for a complimentary flavour. So I'm picking some oak leaves here. 
um, because I'm thinking that the meadow sweet might blend well with the oak leaves. Oak leaf and meadow sweet is an interesting combination, but they'll have to wait to see. Wine making doesn't happen overnight. Anything we're making new, we'll always make a small quantity and then try different blends, different recipes. So it often takes quite a few years, actually, you know, because uh, your fruit or flowers are only in season for one year and then your finished wine isn't ready till the next year. So it's a quite a, a prolonged process. Ron and Judith are after the perfect wine for my fruity puds, and I can't wait to see what bottle delights they've got in store for me. Our country wine producers, Ron and Judith, have joined me in the kitchen. Hello. Hello there. Hi. I think that the, um, the wines that you're currently doing at the moment just blow my mind. I, I was watching it thinking, I've got to try some of this stuff. Now, this one is the meadow... This is the one we saw, the meadow sweet. Yeah, this is the trial one for this year. And you liked it? You, you enjoy this? Yeah. Put, we hardly know it. It's still quite young. It's yeah. the first time that we've uh, produced this one. I've had my eye on it for years. Yeah. Wow. It smells totally different. You know it's alcoholic. You can yeah, smell that. Yeah, yeah. But... What's the proof in that? <laughs> it's it's, it's, uh, it's <laughs> only about 13.5%, but um, it's really... I find it really honey and lemon. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's got yeah. such depth of flavour. Yeah. It's not a liqueur and it's not a wine. It doesn't feel like a convention. It's, it's like, right in the middle. That's right. Exactly. It's, it's That's between the two. I said about yeah. uh, our country wine. Yeah. There's not like something in between. Now, I've got to try this next one. Sorry, I'm going to go through all of them. I've got those five, six, six to go through as well. <laughs> right, here we go. <laughs> this is the... Elderflower wine. Uh, come on, drink up. <laughs> I'm not going to give you new glasses. I want you to drink out of this one. Now, this is the elderflower wine. Which is your... I mean, which is your current favourite at the moment? Which one do you think? Yeah, that's the one I love. Well, I like in the summer. I like the elderflower in the summer because it's a nice, uh, lighter, flowery um, wine, you know, very summery. And if you're lying in a hammock and a cool glass of elderflower wine, it's just great. <laughs> A lot cleaner on the palate. Mm. It's not mm. sweet, mm. but it's a lot cleaner on the palate. Yep. You can yep. taste the elderflower, yep. though. Yep. That's beautiful. It might look like I'm just quaffing wine here, but every good baker has to know his ingredients. Look at the colour of that. That's incredible. Yeah. Oh. oh, that's nice, that. Ah, oh, it is. It's got... Um, it's got a thickness to it. Yeah. It's got more body to it. It's very smooth, though, going in. Yeah. Cooking with that as well, making that into a casserole and putting that with some steak mm. and making it mm. a stew. The, the, the flavour that you get, much more than you would a conventional wine. Mm. It's got a you, lot you, of identity. Yeah, you're adding so many layers to the dishes by adding this sort of wine. I love it. Ron and Judith have brought me some great summer flavours, and I want to use three of them to complement my very different fruit pie fillings. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make some fruit tarts. Now, at the moment, I've got apricot, I've got pear, and I've got apple. Now, I've chosen some wines to go in there, and I'm going to add a little bit of mascarpone to the pear and apple again, just to give it a little bit more liquid to it as well. Blended with the wines, I think it would work quite well. I've got some flour in the bowl. I'm going to add some butter to that as well. And this is where I get my hands a bit dirty. So I'm going to rub this down into crumbs. You can see it's getting there now. It's beginning to break down. Then I'm going to add the egg to that as well, straight in. And then I'm going to add a little squeeze of lemon juice as well. Again, helps break down the pastry. And then I'm going to add some icing sugar. The sweetness is going to come from the icing sugar. You can use caster sugar if you want, but icing sugar keeps it nice and smooth. You're not going to meet any grains in there at all. And you can see already with the egg in there, it's actually beginning to come together quite nicely. You see, it's quite short at the moment, so we've got to work that a little bit. So I'm going to add a little bit of water, a little drop to it like that. It's probably enough. Again, get your hand in there, mix it round. Try and keep all the mess in the bowl, because what happens at this stage is people tend to put it on the bench and it just get really messy, but you're going to try and collect all the ingredients so your bowl is actually nice and clean. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Bring the pastry together nice and lightly. This will ensure that your pastry is not overworked and it's beautiful and flaky. That's enough. At that stage, I'd wrap it up, pop it in a fridge, just solidify the butter a little bit, and it'll help you when you roll it out with a rolling pin. This is one I've rested before. This has been in there for about half an hour, and you can see it's soft, it's pliable, and it's going to make a good base for the fruit pies. Make myself a little bit of room, get my rolling pin, and all I'm going to do is roll out them and use cutters to line this. This is what I'm using to put my tart shells on. They're cute, they're small. It's a couple of mouthfuls. That's all it'll take to eat one of these. I've chosen several of the wines, like the Meadow Sweet, to go with the apricots. I think that should go quite well. Have you tried apricot wine? They we don't tend grow to, in the we, cars we, of Gowrie. No, they don't. <laughs> well, when the global warming uh, means you can <laughs> grow them in the cars of Gowrie, we'll maybe think about it. <laughs> so it is pure. I mean, you're very pure about it. It's literally what grows around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it Apart is. Apart from the odd exception every now and again, the, the very first one I ever made was a citrus wine, which was oranges, lemons and grapefruits. Wow. But we never made it commercial until uh, last year to celebrate our 25th year in business. Have you got the citrus one there? Yeah. I've got some. Right here, I. I'll just stop what I'm doing. OK. Thank you very much. What, 25 what years to celebrate. What launched the whole caper? Yeah. If, if that recipe hadn't been successful, there'd be no, no winery at all. Wow. That's quite powerful as well, isn't it? Yeah, 13.5. It's, it's the same strength, but uh, it's uh, almost spiritus, that one. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> That's scary. Virtually spiritual. It's one of, yeah, it's one of those things which you can, you can drink and then it's, I reckon it starts in your feet. <laughs> and then you get off a bench and just sort of fall over, you know? It's quite dangerous. Um, so you roll it out nice and thin and then cut your bases for the pies. And all you do is fairly simple. Try and use as much space as you can. Take out your pastry and then drop it into the bottom of the tray. And that's it. You just basically line them. It's that simple. I used to do little jam tarts with my mum when I was a kid. We'd line the bottom of the trays like this and literally just add jam to it and bake it, and that's it. And maybe put a little star, which is cut out the sweet pastry in the top so we know which one's mine, because that was the little star for my mum. <laughs> OK, I've lined three of them, but let's run through these ingredients. This is the apricot. Now, I'm going to add a little bit of a slug of this meadow sweet to this as well. For the pear filling, I'm using the elderflower wine. And to complement the apple, I'm adding the elderberry. Because it's quite dry, I think I'll add a little scoopful of mascarpone straight in there as well. Don't worry if you don't have these fruit wines to hand. The beauty of these pies is that you can experiment with your own flavours, Calvados, Amaretti, beer if you like, as long as it works. Is that a strawberry one you've got there? Yeah. How's your glass? Uh, empty. Um, if I could try you some of that, that'd be great. I'll just move these out of your way. This is the ones that are going home. So there's it? nearly a pound of fresh strawberries good in uh, every glass. Really? Bottle. Oh, every bottle. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, well, that's enough, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much. That's, that's, that's absolutely fine. What's the strength of that one? Well, that's quite potent as well, isn't it? Same. Thank you. That's fine. That's lovely. That, the flavour of the strawberry is intense. Yeah. You know, it's not been messed around at all yeah. with too much sweetness. It's just a clean strawberry coming all the way through. That is absolutely... <coughs> that's absolutely the, gorgeous. The strawberries, I mean, this, you would cry when you see this chopping them up, actually. Big, red, fantastic strawberries. They're beautiful. Just, and they're just from five miles away. And they come in straight from the field, chop them up into the wine straight away. Criminal, really. <laughs> <laughs> you prefer to drink them. <laughs> do you know what? So do I now. Time to tear myself away from the wine tasting and fill the pie cases with my different fruity mixtures. And then finally, I'm going to make four lids. Drop them into each tart. 
You can almost make the same thing with mince pie. In fact, mince pies, any one of those mm. would probably work well in a mince pie. You know, to make um, a marinade to soak, that would yeah, be, yeah. be beautiful. So what I'm going to do is just pinch around each one just to give it a little bit of a pattern and that it seals the lid to the base and it just neatens it off. If you add some caster sugar straight to the top, it adds, again, a little bit of sweetness to it and it caramelises on top and they look absolutely delicious. I bake my mini fruit pies at 200 degrees Celsius for 15 to 20 minutes until the pastry is golden brown. You've got these beautiful, very rustic looking tarts. I'll give you a few of these out. Still hot. The smell of the pastry, the golden pastry. Yeah, it's great. And again, a little bit of sugar to finish off with. And the final thing to do is get some of the meadow sweet. <clears throat> Toast yourself. Those are the best individual fruit pies. Absolutely stunning. They may be small, but my fruit pies pack a big flavour punch. They're easy to make, but go down a treat. Guys, you're going to have to wait a little bit later to try them. Thank you very much. Thanks. Sometimes in life you find people who take a simple idea and just run with it, which is exactly what Alex and Stacey, otherwise known as the Moran Girls, have done. Welcome to my kitchen. Hello. Oh. Wow. OK, there's lots of colour here. You've managed to fill pretty much most of the kitchen with the... The colours are amazing, actually, on these meringues. The Moran Girls have done things with egg whites and sugar I never thought possible. Their vibrant, multicoloured meringues use only natural colourings and they're flavoured with a variety of freeze-dried powders. You think that this is the new thing? It, it is, is the new thing. Do you think we so? We know it's the new thing. You see, <laughs> Not I, even I, I, it. Yeah, this is where we probably <laughs> bend slightly. I, I, I think Cronut's the brand new thing. Cronut has been in, it only arrived too, six months too. ago. People Precious. are sick of the cupcake, they're sick of the macaroni. Yeah. They're looking for something, they're hungry for something new. As far as I'm concerned, I look at meringue as um, egg whites, a bit of sugar, and that's it. But you've taken it to a level which, frankly, is scary. Um, <laughs> you've, got, you've got huge... I mean, do you sell them like that as a whole? We generally just sell the kisses and then we do, like, different bespoke orders. And this idea has been going along for how long? About a year now, um, yeah. yeah, and it's just been a bit of a crazy roller coaster of meringuing. Now, I recognise some of these dishes here. Obviously, these pavlova things going on here, which you've got quite substantial bases, mm -hmm. um, filled with the cream and then topped with... Oh, you've got fig and pistachio. This one's a tray bake, that one's a pavlova. And what do you have here? You have a meringue multicoloured rainbow... Rainbow cake. Rainbow is that what layer it is? cake, yeah. And these little, well, onions... They're kisses. <laughs> kisses? How would you work them out as being kisses? The little mouthfuls of heaven. <laughs> What's this one, then? Ooh. Gin and tonic. That's gin and tonic? Yeah. What's that got gin and tonic in there? It's got it's flavoured with juniper berry essence, which tastes very similar to Please gin me. and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> What's the verdict? That is gin and tonic. Yes, it is indeed. We is it alcoholic? Uh, no, no alcohol. Oh. Are you going to show me how you do that? We yeah. are indeed. Kitchen's all yours. <laughs> The meringue girls start by whisking up their egg whites. We use free-range liquid egg whites because once upon a time we had a lot of yolks hanging around. Alex and Stacey have a unique way of making meringue, which is halfway between the French style, which uses cold sugar, and the Italian way, which uses boiling sugar syrup. They heat sugar on a baking tray in an oven at 200 degrees for around 10 minutes. Yep, yeah, it's ready to roll. Cool. The sugar's really hot to the touch now. The edges are lovely and caramelised. The egg whites need to be whisked at high speed until they form stiff peaks. Then, whilst the mixture is still running, add the hot sugar one spoonful at a time. Once all the sugar is added, keep whisking for a further five to seven minutes until the meringue mixture is stiff and glossy. So now we've got our lovely, stiff, beautiful mixture and we are going to use 
We're going to flavour a little bit of this and show you how to pipe some gorgeous little kisses. This is a beautiful freeze-dried passion fruit powder. And then you just want to fold it through really, really gently because you don't want to knock out any of the dreaminess. The <laughs> The dreaminess. The dreaminess. That's, that's her keeminess coming through. <laughs> I've worked with baking for a long time, but never heard of that before. Stacey's word. <laughs> it is. My word. So I've done these lovely stripes um, just alternately down the side of the bag. So you've done the inside of the bag? Inside of the bag. Okay. So we're going to fill it now with the passion fruit meringue. She's left a little tip that she can just going to pull it down end. easy. Yeah. And then you want to spoon it in as, sort of as tightly as possible because you don't want any of those little air bubbles that are going to make your kisses ugly. Yeah. Basically. You don't want ugly kisses. You don't want ugly kisses. No. Ugly kisses. That's enough. Cool. I'm just going to push it all down, make sure that there's no air bubbles, and get all that colour sort of penetrate the sides. So I'm just going to cut the tip off, um, sort of 20p size, something like that. So same, always the piping rules, you know, keeping it tight holding it down, so it's just squeezing and then lifting. And then, well, it's gone a bit marshmallow, but the more you do, the more that colour comes through. And it's quite a stiff mixture. You're not getting that peak that you really want with mm. art. But I think that's just because it's been sitting there for about... It's an effective mix, though. Mm. I mean, the colours on it are incredible. Yeah. Vibrant colours and vi vibrant flavours. While this is all going on, you want to turn your oven down to 100. Yeah. Do you want to have a go? Yeah. Oh, thanks for giving me the bit at the bottom. Sorry, yeah. Oh, thanks <laughs> they a were lot. They were dodgy as it was. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Gorgeous. Oh, it's quite a difficult mixture, isn't it? It, it is. It's, mixture. it's been sitting there too long. <gasps> cool. OK, so... Gorgeous. You do... I mean, I love the way that you've got those colours on there. It's a great idea, actually, painting the inside of the, of the bag to give you that effect. Now. They get baked off at 100 degrees. Yeah. Yes. How long do you bake them off for? 30 to 40 minutes. And you know when they're done. You want the mallow in the middle, never want them dried out. So um, just pull them off the baking paper, and if their bases are intact, um, but they're sort of hollow, you know, you know they're done. Perfect. OK. So you can chuck them in. I'm looking forward to trying some of those. Thank you very much, ladies. I, I love that technique that you did inside the bag as well to produce that meringue. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Now, it's my turn to bake. And I'm going to get Alex and Stacey to use their meringue expertise to add a final twist to my next dessert, the Queen of Puddings. The Queen of Puddings is a baked custard dessert smothered with a layer of jam and finished off with gorgeous Malawi meringue. To start with, you need to make the custard. Now, to make the custard, I've got two egg yolks and a full egg. I'm just going to whisk this together quickly to start with. I mean, this is a very old dish, very old pudding, and it's been around since the 1700s, actually. It was a way of using up the extra breadcrumbs that were around. And it was around since 1740, and it was named after Mary Berry. I'm sorry, Mary. You know I love you, really. The key flavouring for custard is vanilla, and for this recipe, I'm using a fresh vanilla pod, which I split down the middle with a sharp knife. Scrape the seeds out, like so, and then drop the whole pod into the milk and bring that to the boil. Next, you add the caster sugar to the egg and whisk until it's all dissolved. I know in here I'm going to put my breadcrumbs straight in. You don't have to have them as fine as this, you can have them quite chunky. So again, you Breadcrumbs straight in. This is the stabiliser within the custard as well. This is what gives the custard its depth. Now, what you do here is I've got some milk, which is just coming up to the boil now. There it is, it's just gone. I'm going to pour that onto the egg. Always pour your hot milk mixture into the egg and not the other way around, and keep whisking, or you'll risk curdling your custard. And then this mixture will go on top of the breadcrumbs. This is a classic baked custard recipe, which I pour into pre-buttered ramekins. They need to be baked at 180 degrees in a bain-marie for 25 to 30 minutes, or until the custard is set. There's a little bit of tension there, so if you touch the top, it's still jelly-like, it'll wobble. But it's got, it's got substance as well, because you've got the breadcrumbs in there absorbing that liquid as well. So it's got more body to it than a traditional custard. So the next layer to add is the jam. Now, I've got some raspberry jam here. 
Again, get a nice spoonful of jam, lay it on top of the custard, and just take the jam to the outside of the ramekin. Got to wait till the custard's nice and cool before you do this, so it doesn't bleed in, so you don't get any bleeding from the jam into the custard. So that's one. So what have you decided to do for the top here? What are you going to use, that meringue? Yeah, we are going to flavour it. Because you're doing a raspberry jam, we're going to do a lovely raspberry meringue um, with some beautiful freeze-dried raspberries. So I've got one more to do. Should we start mixing this in yeah. later on? Yeah, please, yeah. OK. <coughs> lovely. Lovely. <laughs> I think with the addition with this meringue, it should be, it should look quite spectacular. We're going to paint it and do sort of little mini kisses, but you could just whack it on. But why not? Absolutely. OK. okay. So you're going to do lots of mini kisses or one big kiss on the top? A few little ones, I think. OK. To finish off the Queen of Puddings, Stacey tops each one with a vibrant raspberry flavoured meringue mixture. The big fellas a kiss is one of these little fellas. <laughs> a little mini pecks on the cheek. Little pecks on the cheek. So I'm just going to give it a quick blowtorch. I don't want to take too much colour off it. Gorgeous. I'm happy with that. Yeah. I think that, with that layer of jam, with those raspberry pecks on the cheek. Exactly on the top. Make the perfect Queen of Puddings. best part of the day for me. Uh, there's plenty of food here to eat. Now, you guys took in. Obviously, to start with, we've got the luxury fish pie. This is the most luxurious fish pie I could possibly make, thanks to the addition of Mike's exquisite langoustines. And I can't wait for my guests to try it. But if you're tempted to use fish fingers in yours, do me a favor, don't. Look at yourself a piece. Yum. Good texture in the fish, eh? Because it's it's still all together. It hasn't gone mushy or anything. Absolutely. Mm. I think the saffron yeah. helps. Yeah, no, it does. It's just coming through. <laughs> Unbelievable. This is really good. <laughs> and next, it's a dessert double whammy. My regal queen of puddings is crowned by Alex and Stacey's stripy meringue. And not to forget my gorgeous individual pies, each concealing a different delicious fruity heart flavoured with those fruit wines. I don't know which one. It's a surprise. I've no idea what I'm going to be eating. <laughs> I've got an apple. It's very nice. I've got the apricot. That was gorgeous. Amazing. <laughs> Tell me what you think of this. Mm. It's really nice. It's great. Mm. I was expecting it to be a lot sweeter than it is. It's actually mm. deliciously That's creamy. Awesome. There's nothing better than sharing great food with good company. I've loved cooking today's dishes with the fantastic ingredients my guests were kind enough to bring with them. I hope you'll join me again next time on Pies and Puds. See you then. Go check with the new series of MasterChef The Professionals. All the episodes so far are available now on the BBC iPlayer. And also don't miss Saturday Kitchen tomorrow at the earlier time of 9.15 on BBC One. But next, it's all aboard the Antiques Road Trip.